Dead Triathlon Show 288. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode I interview Jamie Pringle. Jamie is an exercise physiologist with a background in both academia as well as applied work, uh, among other things with the English Institute of Sports where he covered several Olympic cycles and many different Olympic sports. Jamie is currently working at a company called Vortec uh, covering aerodynamics and cycling biomechanics. They have a wind tunnel and a really advanced wind tunnel there in Silverstone. Uh, Vortec is actually a spin-off from a Formula One based company. But this uh, discussion will cover many different uh, aspects of uh, triathlon performance, including physiology, coaching and training, and of course, some aerodynamics, including some equipment talk regarding considerations for getting a tri suit and uh, calf guards and uh, shoes to some extent. Just uh, to clear up, I think in last week's episode, I mentioned that we would have Val Burke on in uh, this episode, and we just had to delay that interview. So she will be on in a couple of weeks' time. Val Burke is the coach of Braden Curry and some other high level athletes uh, based down in New Zealand. Uh, but yeah, that will be coming up later, but it had to be pushed forward a little bit. Now, before we get into the interview with Jamie Pringle, big thanks to our sponsors. First, we have Roka, that are the world-leading manufacturers of wetsuits, tri suits, swimskins, goggles, high-performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses. Roka's origin is in the wetsuit business. It started uh, in a garage in Texas with the mission of creating the world's fastest wetsuit. And uh, the wetsuits are still a main part of Roka's business. And they have now a number of different wetsuits, all the way from the flagship Maverick X2 model down to the entry-level Maverick Comp 2 model and everything in between, including a thermal wetsuit and a swim-run wetsuit. All of Roka's wetsuits have the patented arms up technology, they are designed with premium materials and a ton of other bells and whistles, depending on which wetsuit you get. You can check out all of the details on roca.com. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say that even if you go for an entry-level wetsuit, you will get a really, really high-quality wetsuit when you get one from Roca. You can get 20% off your order with the discount code that you can get on roca.com forward slash TTS. And thank you to Senate that you can find on senateswimtrainer.com. The Senate Swim Trainer allows you to get more frequency of training stimulus in swimming, uh, whether it is by using it as an adjunct to the training you're already doing in the pool, or maybe if pools are still closed where you live due to the pandemic, uh, that might be your one outlet for practicing that muscle memory with the swim-specific specific movement. And with the design of the Senate Swim Trainer, it allows you to train the, your swim stroke very specifically because you will be doing it in the same position as in swimming that is lying face down uh, on the swim bench and it also has an instability element to it so you'll have to activate your core to make sure that you don't fall off the bench. So it is very specific. Uh, it is uh, compared to using normal stretch cords where you will be putting a lot of strain through your hamstrings and posterior chain. The Zen 8 Swim Trainer will put you in a much more similar position to what you will experience when you're actually swimming and therefore you will be training your muscle groups in a in a better and more specific way. You can get 20% off your order of the Senate Swim Trainer with the promo code that you can get on senateswimtrainer.com forward slash TTS. Now one final quick ask before we get into the interview. If you have a moment and you like the podcast and you haven't yet submitted a rating and a review for it, it would really be appreciated if you could do that because that helps other people find the podcast and it helps the podcast keep being sustainable, keep growing and keep going. So, so if you can submit a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast, that would be much, much appreciated. All right, let's get into the interview with Jamie Pringle. Today's guest on that triathlon show is uh, Jamie Pringle. Jamie, uh, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. And um, thank you for inviting me on. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, why don't you start by introducing yourself and telling the audience a little bit more about you and, and your background in endurance sports? Yes, I'd love to. Yeah, so right now, um, my, I'm working in the commercial sector. I'm a scientist by trade, a physiologist, that's my original background. 
Um, but right now, I work for a company called Vortex Sports, which is um, it's a spin-off of a Formula One company, an aerodynamics company. But we have a center in Silverstone here in the UK that's dedicated to cycling and, and any other sports where speed is involved, really, um, with a wind tunnel and then laboratory suites for biomechanics and physiology and physiotherapy as well. And we actually, most of the work we're doing right now is around clothing manufacturing and equipment. So that's where the company is being based. Um, we work with a variety of professional teams in cycling and, and federations, national federations, and some high-performing individuals, including some very high-performing triathletes. But as I say, my background is as a scientist, uh, as a physiologist. Yeah, and, and in in your current role, uh, I looked at the Vortec website, and uh, am I right in saying that uh, you are involved in uh, creating the, the skin suits for the British track cycling team for Tokyo? Yes, there are aspects of that. We we work with everybody, actually, um, uh, across all different nations and different professional teams. Um, you know, it's the it's just an open market in that sense. Um, yeah, and it has a long history as well, as you'd be very aware of, because some of the, the roots of that kind of work date back sort of 15 to 20 years um, with some of the some of the Olympic and Paralympic programs that got lottery funding here in the UK. So it has a long history, but now it's become a very um, a very popular, of course, and a very competitive market. So people need to to keep up with it. Yeah, and uh, and in your past roles, uh, I know you were with the English Institute of Sport and involved there during a couple of Olympic cycles, I believe. Can you tell us a bit more about what you were doing in that role? Yes, that's right. So I, in, here in the UK, I've worked in the, the world-class sector, the English Institute of Sports, the, the organization that provides science and medicine and some engineering support for um, national um, governing bodies. So the, the national teams across a whole variety of sports, uh, everything from in, you know in the endurance sports, which we're talking about today, through to team sports and combat sports. Um, I was a physiologist with that group for the best part of a decade, leading some of the, the research and innovation in, initiatives, um, and as I say, not just in, in endurance sports. And then I had a, a small period um, with British Athletics as the head of science in the lead into the Rio 2016 Games, the Olympics and Paralympics there, uh, which was a much broader role, not just being a, a physiologist, but working across the entire um, science spectrum, if you like. And then many years ago, actually, if you go back quite a, a long way, because I'm getting quite old, um, I was a university academic, um, and I still keep a handle on that academic steering wheel by being involved with supervising various PhDs and working with a handful of universities, really largely to try and improve the application of their research to make it more real, make it your, more useful, um, and so on. What kind of research were you doing when you were in academia? Yeah, well, my background is in um, cardiovascular, cardiorespiratory capacity. Um, that's where I did my own PhD uh, many years ago, understanding how, uh, largely for endurance capacity, um, and how and how the body transports and utilizes oxygen, which is obviously the backbone of anything to do with endurance, um, and looking at the muscle characteristics between different types of individuals and different types of modalities of how that determines how oxygen is used so something specifically called oxygen uptake kinetics mm. how the body switches on at the start of exercise or to a change in intensity and how the muscle adapts to that and how it extracts oxygen at that um, mitochondrial level and so, and so it's yeah so i had a uh, my background is in quite um you know fundamental exercise physiology in that sense yeah uh, i'm sure you're aware of mark burnley uh he's a past guest on the show and we talked about oxygen kinetics with with him mm -hmm. so uh yeah mark and i share a a very similar path we started our phds on the same day on the first day right. together uh he was down south in brighton i was up north in manchester but we've had very similar paths with uh shared uh, supervisors and done work together over the years. So, and he, um, for his sins, my sins, I think for his sins, he now lives uh, 500 meters away from me here in Loughborough. <laughs> well, actually, it, it, you share something else, and that is that uh, I got connected to both of you through uh, Professor Andy Jones, uh, who is also a right. guest on the show. He, he was the one who recommended uh, you yes. guys for uh, potential guests. Uh, I had one follow up uh, topic uh, about your background, and that is uh, in. In coaching, so uh, I believe you have been coaching individuals as well in uh, cycling and perhaps some other sports. So can you tell us a bit more about your coaching background? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, well, firstly, I think I probably wouldn't call myself a coach uh, as such. I have coached and I do coach athletes, but 
I think that coach athlete relationship is a very specific and special dynamic. And I'd probably call myself more of an ad- advisor, if anything, like a point of reference, a sounding board, if you like. Um, but it's, it's really enjoyable as a, uh, you know, if you put the scientific hat on to be able to then apply that to people who you can work with, who are trying to be the best they can be and to take those scientific principles into coaching. It's, it's a really nice, satisfying close of the loop, if you like, of, of applying your knowledge. And it works the other way around. I think if you go there as a, you know, you're working with somebody as their coach and you're then you're calling upon scientific method and scientific thinking, um, uh, then that's quite nice as well. So I think it's it's really, uh, I would really, whenever I'm talking with young um, uh, practitioners who are on the start of their career, um, you almost always say, go and coach people. You know, it, you, you, it's one thing to be a physiologist or a biomechanist or a sports psychologist, whatever you do. But to see how it actually gets applied and how it makes a difference and how people engage with it, you've got to put that coaching hat on. And so, as I say, I, I wouldn't call myself a coach, but when I wear that hat, that's really important because it brings context to everything else we do as scientists. Of course, there are great scientists out there who never do that. But I think if you want to be a really good sports scientist, you really gotta, you've really got to dive into that, um, into that world and, and wear that hat. I'm mixing my metaphors, but you know what I mean. That, that's a great perspective. Uh, it, really interesting. I never heard somebody uh, really talk about that, but it makes, makes sense now that you say it. Um, and finally, in terms of which sports you've been involved with, of course, many of the things that you discussed here, like your background in physiology, uh, your current work with things like aerodynamics and biomechanics, they're translatable or transferable between different sports and almost agnostic to that. But but in, in terms of like which sports you've been the most involved with, can you just li- list them so we get a bit of an idea of that? Yeah, so well, I've largely been most involved with racing sports. I was going to say endurance sports, but some of them are quite short duration, you know, effectively, you know, sprinters and, and so on. But so anything where it's linear racing sports has been, probably been my bag. And I think, um, you know, when I first started in exercise physiology, that's that's a really, uh, I was going to say it's an easy kind of scenario to, to understand. It's certainly one of the most um, uh, measurable and one of the ones where you can break down the components of performance, which we'll talk about in a moment, I'm sure. Um, so I worked across a number of sports in the endurance realm, um, from, from running, cycling, swimming, even a little bit of rowing and some cross country skiing as well and things like that. Um, so yeah, so working across that realm, but then I do actually think it's really important for physiologists to expose themselves to different sports that are quite, you know, quite different demands because it gives you a a sense of how to, how to understand the performer because fundamentally it's still a human being doing their thing. And that might be in team sports, you know, games play, um, and it might even be in things like combat sports. So my role with the English Institute of Sport worked across all sorts of sports, including sailing, boxing, uh, badminton, taekwondo, and you. And it's all about working with a human performer who's trying to, you know, achieve their best. Mm, yeah. All right. So we have a lot to dig into, but before we go deep into any particular topic, uh, I would like to ask you for mostly amateur uh, endurance athletes that are the listener the main listener group of this podcast although we have coaches and pro athletes as well but uh, for that particular demographic what would your top three pieces of advice off the top of your head be great um first i would say do stuff (laughs) do stuff and repeat and i wouldn't worry too much about specific durations and things and trying to achieve a certain uh, a certain score on this that and the other i think it's more important to get out there and do things and add it up and i think you know why i say that not not just because it simplifies it but there's a growing body of evidence physiological evidence that time training can be added up accumulated you know over days and weeks and sessions in a day and in some cases, in some senses, actually, the muscle might benefit from doing more frequent things and it might actually from doing one longer continuous thing. So, uh, you know, when you've got that as a principle, just get out there and do stuff and enjoy it. Do as much as you can, but enjoy what you do and still enjoy it, of course. I think that would be my number one. Um, that said, I would also say be precise with what you do. Um, and I think it's something which uh, the more that you do, as in the more training that you do and maybe the more serious you take it, and the further you want to go with it, I think this becomes more important. The precision of intensity, making easy things easy and hard things hard, and making sure they don't migrate into that middle zone, um, is I think really becomes quite important uh, because you're not just balancing training and getting fitter, but you're also managing fatigue and tiredness and progression. Um, and of course, enjoy it. 
you know, the third thing would be enjoy the journey. I, I, I ne- it never fails to nicely surprise me that, you know, that it's a privilege to be fit and healthy and to do, and to be able to train at such a level of capacity. And I think there's a lot of satisfaction you can take in that in terms of what you're achieving. And it's, and it's more than just for racing. It's the fact you can, you can train and you can train with you know, great function and enjoy what you're doing. So yeah, do stuff, be precise with it and enjoy the journey. Yeah, that's great advice. Now, uh, if we start talking a little bit about uh, physiology, uh, so, well, actually, one follow up on what you mentioned there with uh, your the research that you've been doing in the in the cardiovascular function uh, in endurance sports in particular, uh, this is something that always intrigues me, and I keep getting different answers to the question, which makes me think that it's not very simple or easy to get a direct <laughs> answer ask, to it. But it's you're not asking a physiologist about the causes of fatigue, are you? Mm, no, 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 I'm not going to ask, ask you about that. Uh, I'm going to ask you about uh, whether. It, how you can figure out, uh, or and if it makes a difference, if an athlete is limited uh, peripherally or centrally uh, in terms yeah. of their oxygen uh, uptake. Yeah, it's a really good question, I, and I think you know what you've just described there—that central or peripheral limitation. So the cardiovascular or the mus- mus- uh, muscular is, if in essence, really the heart. And no, that's the wrong word to use. It's it's the it's the complete foundation of endurance performance. You know, the ability to deliver oxygen and to use it, and it's why we would do exercise physiology profiling of an athlete because by profiling those component parts um, through various methods, um, you get that insight to where there might be a limiting step in that chain. Now, generally speaking, generally speaking, it's the heart that is the limiting step to endurance capacity. Um, the heart delivers, pumps blood and delivers oxygen to the muscle and the muscle uses it. The muscle can only use as much oxygen as the heart is delivering and the blood is carrying it um, through hemoglobin. So it's a, it mostly it's a central limited story, but not always. And in the long uh, duration sustained endurance um, performance, then it's very clearly peripheral conditioning becomes absolutely vital to that. Um, but going back to the point around sort of physiological profiling, well, that's why we do it. You know, you're looking at basically looking across the the systems of the body. And I always make the um, analogy. It's a bit like when the, you take the car into the garage. And this, what we do as physiologists is lift the bonnet up. And we're not just looking at the engine. You're looking at the chassis as well. And you're looking at everything that goes into that, the fuel. Um, and you're looking to try and identify where you can really see Strength and weaknesses, but also give, get insight into how those strengths can be capitalized on and how we can target the weaknesses. And I think that probably describes what an exercise physiologist should be doing for a living. Yeah. So uh, can you describe a bit more in, in detail that profiling? What, what are the steps involved in it? Would, or what mm. way would you do physiological profiling with an endurance athlete? Um, well, this, I think it's twofold, really. I think you've got the, the classic... Um, bring them into a laboratory and probably un- undergo a number of um, pu- uh, exercise challenges, not always maximal ones. You know, you, sometimes the best thing you can do is just get is simulate the event and see how they deliver that. Um, but the classic incremental tests where you're looking at across a spectrum of intensity from low intensity to, to, to high intensity to maximal and seeing how the body is keeping up with the demand, essentially. Um, seeing how it's breathing, uh, cardiovascular, mus- muscular point of view, and all the responses that you can measure within that. Um, uh, you know, then you can start diving more deeply into certain parts of that mouth to muscle story. And, you know, oxygen comes in at the mouth and it's used at the muscle and all those steps in between. Um, we can get a handle on in some sort of measure that will give us an insight as to where those limitations might be. Would you use something like, uh, muscle oxygen saturation for, uh, getting a deeper insight into that or, or some other methodology? Uh, yes and no. I mean, you, you, it's, that's quite a tricky one to actually harness as in to really make sense of the of the metrics. Um, you can of, often get quite a lot of interpretation from your classic um, pulmonary gas exchange measures around what's going on at the muscle level. You can get insight into obviously things like fuel use, um, but also you know you're getting insight there into um, in how how the respiratory side of things is keeping up with the demand that the muscle is placing upon it. Um, and this is, remember, this is used for not just for athletes. This is used across the spectrum of health as well. And, you know, this is how we make, um, uh, 
if you like, uh, we can identify, we can be diagnostic about an individual's limitations. When, as I say, we're not just talking about an athlete where hopefully what you're seeing is a lot of their capacity markers are very high, very good. But we could use that with an unhealthy population to identify where they might have actual specific pathologies. Um, and you're getting that from exercise testing. Mm. If, uh, if I'm an, an amateur triathlete and, and I want to do some profiling of myself that, that I'll find useful uh, in my training and be able to apply some information and, and train perhaps more precisely, get more out of my training, what would you recommend that, that I do in terms of profiling? If, if you can just list it out? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think, um, I think 20 years ago, that would be a different answer to what we have now, because I think now you've got so many tools available and they're really good as well. And, you know, the, you know, we've, we've moved beyond a stopwatch. We've got, uh, you know, direct measurements of power in cycling and derivative derivatives of that in running and so on. Um, so your lab is your bike, your what bike, it's your swimming pool, it's your treadmill, it's your GPS watch, uh, and it's your heart rate monitor. And, and I think, you know, pretty much all we do in exercise physiology is anchored to work rate, to power or pace or a derivative of it. And with those, what are really actually really, really good ways of quantifying that accurately and pre- um, with really good precision, then you've got a big portion of the story there. And with a heart rate monitor and you know, using that and, and knowing what those numbers would look and feel like on a daily basis, then the athlete's got tools at hand where they don't need to come into a lab and come and see an exercise physiologist. They are their own lab. You know, they're, they're, as I say, the lab is their, is their training environment and what doing what they do on a daily basis. So I think you soon get a feel for how your body works, how you can do certain training sessions and how you recover between them. So um, I would, yeah, as I say, for an amateur athlete, I would not be worrying about being too sophisticated from it. You've got loads of tools at hand. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great answer. And, uh, from a coaching perspective, it's one that for a lot of athletes, I think is, it very much, uh, is enough to, to do the day-to-day training and get the data and the feedback from the athlete, but, and then perhaps add some field testing to it. For example, I like to do something like a prescriber 20 on the bike a 20 second sprint and a three minute all out test and perhaps a longer yeah. test but sometimes you don't even need that because you get a sense already from some more extended duration training so so even with just two fairly short maximum tests i tend to get a really good idea of of an athlete's physiological profile by by some short duration tests i think so and i think you you know you're training um endurance athletes even if you're a lower low volume athlete you still train a lot and so you're getting lots of repeated insights into potentially doing the same thing and that's actually your baseline which you make your comparisons of am i progressing or am i, am I changing am i getting better so I, I just think you know the, the the ability to use training for that purpose is is really really useful yeah you mentioned the heart rate monitor there several times, and mm. uh, and I mean I think it's a f- absolutely fantastic tool. And uh, but we do hear every now and then, although I think that I used to hear it a bit more a few years ago, perhaps than now, which is a good thing. But uh, but you do hear sometimes and see sometimes people saying that uh, heart rate is pretty useless because it varies based on temperature and caffeine and all these things. Which I mean, yes, there is variation, but your power also varies based on those things. So so I don't think that that's a legit uh, a legitimate explanation for why you shouldn't uh, or reason for why you shouldn't use heart rate but can you just elaborate a little bit on why heart rate is useful even though it might not always perfectly match uh what you did before yeah well your heart still beats whether you're measuring it or not well you hope it does <laughs> you're in trouble otherwise um yeah, I, I really, I think, you know, what's the purpose of it? Well, it's, it's about precision and control, I think. Can, precision and control largely with intensity in training. I mean, if you put a heart rate monitor on in racing, you're probably just going to scare yourself because it's super high all the time. Um, and that might not be what, that's not why we're using it. It's more that when you, you know, I mentioned earlier about when you want to do an easy session and make sure it really is easy and it's not too stressful, then you you know where the upper limit of that might be, for example. Um, or if you're trying to do some sort of that tempo work where it's controlled, steady, but quite a bit, a little bit faster than normal. And there's an upper limit to that where you think I can keep this in control and you're using a heart rate monitor to give you the guidance on that. So it's, it's, it has to be for purpose. You know, it has to be, uh, has to be there for something that you can actually make, make sense of it and make use of it. 
And I think the control of intensity and the precision of your effort is where, where it comes into it. Yeah. So, so what would you say if you're advising an athlete and they tend to do their low intensity rides at, for example, 200 watts, and typically their heart rate would be 140 beats per minute for that 200 watts. But then one day they go out and do their low intensity ride and their heart rate is at 150 or 155. Mm. What would the advice be then? Should they lower their power to get their heart rate closer to? Uh, Yeah, it's a good question. And maybe they should, because it might be indicative that there's, you know, uh, some sort of fatigue that's still, still around, or there there might even be some sort of, um, you know, sickness on the horizon. So, but again, I think it, you know, without knowing exactly why that is, the the most important point there is if the athlete has a self awareness of what normal looks like for them and what a deviation from normal might look like, then that's a athletic self awareness. That's a really important skill to generate to to have and to you know to be confident in. Um, and I think again, it's another tool in the toolbox: a heart rate monitor, a power meter, a GPS, whatever it might be. Um, it's just another tool in the toolbox. It might not tell all the story in, in isolation, but in combination with other things, you know, and, and most importantly, things like perception of effort, um, you know, that then this will give you just uh, help you make a better decision whether you should back off a little bit or push on a bit. Yeah, no, I, I think that that combination with perception of effort is is a key part of it. Uh, I mean, if, yeah. if you did have a double espresso before, then maybe you can keep, <laughs> keep your normal power and, and and take that as the explanation for the heart rate, but. Uh, but yes. if, if you actually feel that combined with the heart rate being a bit high, you also feel maybe maybe a little bit uh, a, a little bit more fatigued or just not as strong as your your normal self. Then then that could be indicative of yeah whatever. But but then it might make sense to to back off a bit. I'm probably inclined to be quite cautious with that because you've you've got somebody you know your heart beat and your heart rate there is is actually a good indication of how your body is responding to the to the strain that you're putting on it. And actually, that's probably more important than the strain part of the equation, because, you know, ultimately training is to elicit a physiological adaptation as well as to enjoy, it, of course. But if the physiological adaptation depends on the stress you're putting on, the strain that you're putting on the body, then it's important to measure that. And if, yeah, you are actually this is causing more strain than you thought, then that's that's something to be aware of. Yeah, yeah. And especially for those low intensity workouts, as you say, because yeah. then the yeah. whether you're stress in terms of the power you produce is very low or even lower it doesn't really matter it's not that's not the uh, the main point yeah. of that anyway yeah all right um well one thing you also mentioned from your uh, physiology uh, background is uh, an interest in performance modeling and uh, i don't know anything more about uh, this what what exact modeling you uh, you have been doing but i'm curious to hear if you can explain a bit more about that Yes, of course. Uh, it's probably it's performance modeling sounds probably a lot more sophisticated than it really is. I think actually it's a reasonably simple thing of just figuring out what it takes to win, figuring out what the components of that performance are, in this case, the physiological capacities. Um, I'm breaking down, if you like, the speed of a rider or the power of a rider into the component parts. So, you know, and, and you could take it even a higher level than that, you know, before we start diving into the physiology of that, it might be actually the first thing we need to say was, if we produce it, we'll take the rider, for example, because it's the easy one to quantify. If you're producing power at the pedal, we also know things like your aerodynamic drag, which we'll talk about in a bit. We know the weight of the system, the rolling resistance of the tires and so on. And you're working through all those component parts to then say, well, if we see this, this, and this, it, it will lead to this. And that's really creating a model that says this represents all the components of the performance. Now, if we then dived into one part of that and we could say, right, let's have a look at the physiology of this, then we can create that model according to you know the, the core, the key, three key main components of uh, endurance physiology. You know, if we know that you can produce X amount of watts, um, 300, let's say, let's round it, round it up to 300 watts for an hour, then that requires a cardiovascular capacity of this, a VO2 max score of that, um, being able to sustain a certain percentage of that maximum and being economical in how you transfer that to power at the pedal. And those three aspects are really will explain the vast majority of endurance performance, central engine capacity, that ability, the muscular conditioning to hold a high percentage of it and the economy, the efficiency of transferring it into speed or power. And it's really, so that's the performance modeling. You're working across that. 
by then saying, can we quantify it? Yes, we can. But also what happens when we change something? So um, let's give an example. So, you know, in, in marathon running, in distance running as a whole, if we use a, a fancy new shoe with a carbon fiber plate purported to improve running economy by 4%, then we know exactly it's physiological maths effectively. You know, we know exactly what that will translate to to running speed on the road, given the other components in there. And we can even throw into things like the environment. So what happens when you go into to high altitude, you know, the, the loss of capacity. That's all part of that modeling process. Um, it's physiological maths and physics, really, that we're dealing with. When you're working with high-level athletes, uh which end would you start with? Let's say you have somebody going to the Olympics in an Olympic sport. It might be track cycling or road cycling or triathlon or swimming, whatever it is. Would you start with looking at, okay, what what do we think it will take to win this Olympic triathlon in terms of cycling ability, running ability, swimming ability, and then see where the athlete is and see, okay, where are the gaps? Or would you start with, the athlete and uh, like do their like break down all the components and then try to see where might you have some easy gains or potential gains and where might the athlete be close to their potential or close to maxed out how how does that work in in an applied context yeah good question i think i think they probably come together i think they're two sides of the same coin you know one side you've got what does the world class look like and you can almost reverse engineer your performer to say well if you if you want to beat that record or you want to win that gold, you're going to have to achieve this. And then the other side of the coin is, well, this is where you're at right now. And this is how far you've got to, you know, to improve. And of course, some of those components might be much harder to shift than others. Um, so you've got to then say, well, actually, do we, you know, do we target those and the, the vast amount of training it might take to shift one uh, small part of the profile when there might actually be lower hanging fruit somewhere else to, to, to go for. Um, I think whenever, you know, with you, the example there of somebody who's on the trajectory to go and compete at the highest level, then they probably have been on that trajectory for almost all their career after they've figured out which events suit them best. Um, but there are examples and there's good examples of people who make transfers between sports. You know, I can name a few rowers who have become very successful Olympic champion track cyclists and done it on a very quick time scale. you know, within probably a, an Olympic cycle, four years, they've gone from one sport to another because they have the same underpinning physiological characteristics from a cardiovascular, cardiorespiratory point of view. And then they've gone specifically applied it to the task of that event, you know, maybe a 4K pursuit, 3K pursuit, whatever it might be. Um, and it's they've looked at, I know I have in my model, these things have, are really, really strong, but there's a specific thing here riding around a track, for example, at, um, you know, 50 to 60 kilometers per hour on a fixed gear at a high cadence, I need to learn how to do that, how to, you know, apply my, translate my um, capacity into, into power at the pedal in that environment. And so I think those, those can, you know, which comes first? Well, you have to look at them both. You have to say, what have you got and what does it take to win? And uh, on on the other end of the spectrum, if we are, you are an amateur athlete, then, maybe you're not looking to win the event you're just looking to be the best athlete that you can be and uh, but can you still still use this sort of modeling can you look at yourself and try to try to see again identify those more low, low hanging fruits perhaps and uh, how, what would you advise amateur athletes to take away from that yeah i think so obviously you, you need to look across your um spectrum of you know spectrum of capabilities that's a bit of a long phrase but you need to look at what you can do and I, I, yeah absolutely now I, i'd go as far as saying that you know everybody will have something that is world class about them you know everyone will have a certain part of their physical physiological makeup that will be really really good um there'll be other bits that won't be so good and so finding exploring and finding out what you know what you're good at is all part of that i think and you know certain people and you know to give you an example certain people will have a great incredibly efficient effective technique on the bike or in the swim they might not have a particularly big engine um but they're able to deliver what they've got very efficiently very effectively um it's something which i think we're it's, it's some of my work i'm doing with with a company um with uh what bike the we're looking at how the just the regular average user can figure out what makes their profile up without having to do any testing just by riding just by getting out there and riding 
and giving insight as to what your capabilities might allow you to do or what they might actually point you towards you might have more satisfaction more enjoyment doing Mm, yeah and what's your take on training strengths versus weaknesses uh, and no, in, in, part- in particular for the amateur because on again on the world class scene we might have people might already have a vo2 max that it's as, as high as it's ever going to get so that that's nece- that's not necessarily yeah so so in that scenario i would assume that maybe you're you're more looking at the the weaknesses and trying to bring them up but for amateurs I think it's a bit more tricky perhaps to decide which way to go because there are, mm. even though you say that everybody has something that's worth less about them, but there are many possible improvements that they can do, especially in triathlon when there's three different disciplines that you're working on. So so what do you think about that? It's a really good question. I don't know what the answer is, if I'm honest. Um uh, because I think I think you've also got to look not just how far you might have room for improvement with a certain uh component of your of what makes you an athlete, but also just how hard it is to shift it. You know, what you would often see with less experienced athletes is their economy and efficiency of motion. So the, if you, if you look at it from an energetic cost, um, is often the thing that will improve all the way through their career. But it's also often the thing that if you come into it and you've not actually had experience, let's say you were, let's say you're a cyclist who's getting into triathlon and you're learning how to swim it is likely, not always, but it is likely that your efficiency, your energetic cost of swimming will be high um, because you've not, you know, there's two, two, at least two factors to that. Mechanically, you might not be very effective, but also they're just the muscular conditioning might mean that the actual um, uh, energy cost is high. So you would say, well, you should chart, you know, maybe you should target that. And that's really tackling a weakness rather than playing to a strength it just might take so much work to do that that actually you go well let's let's you know let's go and have a look at other things that i can make up that lost time with um and it's a hard question to answer it's 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 at least threefold harder when you've got triathlon um and it might be actually more than that because of the interactions across all the all the modes as well yeah i haven't given you an answer yeah. there have i so <laughs> no I, I i don't think you did and i don't think i have a personal <laughs> opinion on it as well it's just interesting to hear how you reason around that question it is it is extremely difficult and and uh but yeah in the swimming example i think i think that in the swimming example it's easier than for example in running because in running you kind of just run and then gradually your economy improves and improves in swimming i think you actually can do some things that might uh in, speed up the trajectory in terms of for example getting some individual coaching for technique specifically yeah. and uh, doing video analysis and, and those sorts of things. But, uh, but yeah, it's funny you, you mentioned there, like how much, how much room to, you have to improve, but also how difficult it is. It's something I talked about in a recent episode about swim video analysis, specifically that making a, a difficulty versus impact matrix almost or the possible things you can improve that's kind of a, a good way that you can go with with that particular aspect but maybe you can do it at a larger scale with all the possible improvements you can make in swimming biking and running a, as well and consider that and in in the running example going back to the running economy i i don't think there's not that much you can do to specifically improve economy you can maybe do some strength training or plyometrics or whatever but just run up and down hills. Up and down hills, yeah, yeah. Suggesting, yeah, yeah. But do a large. I think what you just described. Well, I think what you just described there is good coaching. You know, you you're taking a systematic look across all the component parts of the of the performer of the individual and saying, what can we work on and and where are you going to get the most reward from and potentially where is it going to be the most enjoyable because you'll get quicker reward. Yeah, 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 and I guess that in terms of whether it's a strength or a weakness. Uh, it's still the same things apply if you whether even if it's a strength but you can you have a possible possibility for a big impact a big improvement there and it might not be the most difficult thing to do either then it makes sense to work on strengths so yeah i guess the answer isn't necessarily strengths uh, versus weaknesses it's it can be one or the other yeah all right well let's move on to some aerodynamics uh talk and uh i mean that's something that you're very deep into right now uh with your current role of course so in terms of just discussing cycling here at this point how it, and when you get high level athletes uh, or athletes in general that come and, and assess their aerodynamics what, what is the process that you're using currently 
Uh, we use three main approaches with with a real life rider. That is, um, you've got the road, you've got the track, and you've got the wind tunnel. And I think each method there offers an increasing level of precision. Most of my work at the moment is in the wind tunnel, um, but we still work with on the track and on on the uh, and on the road. Uh, anywhere, any time that you can measure the speed of a rider and how much power they're using to propel themselves, you're getting an insight into aerodynamic drag. So, um, so long as you can measure those component parts, you can, you can, it's a, you know, it's a physics equation to understand how, how aerodynamically efficient somebody is. Um, at the moment, the wind tunnel is my weapon of choice, um, because we're doing work with, with athletes and we're doing work with, um, equipment as well as clothing. So it offers us the level of precision and control um, that makes it f- far more effective and a productive um, methodology than than being out on the road, which uh, is, is still good, though. The road and track is still great for that. Yeah. Uh, how applicable would you say that the testing you do in a wind tunnel is to what happens on the track and, and in particular on the road where things in a road race, for example, I mean, you can see a situation where somebody, a road cyclist, comes into a wind tunnel and is quite aerodynamic, but then at a kilometer 180 of a stage race, they have put on their rain jacket and they are in a completely different yeah. position and configuration than they were at the start. Um, well, we can certainly measure the drag of your flappy rain jacket. We actually do that quite often yeah. <laughs> just to illustrate the point of how sometimes how un- 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 aerodynamic they are. Um, it is directly applicable. Um, if you find a way to go faster in the wind tunnel, you'll find a way to go faster on the road or the track. Um, some people say, well, is it, you know, is it transferable as in, do you, would you get the same numbers, the same data? Well, the way that we calibrate the wind tunnel, um, means that we do. So we calibrate the wind tunnel. We can actually calibrate the wind to make sure we're blowing the wind at the rider at the, exactly the right speed and direction and pressures. And then you're, you're calibrating the turntable that the rider is riding on because that's how we measure the drag force, the pushback of the wind. So those numbers are real. So if we blow 50 kilometers an hour wind at you on the, uh, in the wind tunnel, then the resultant drag force that you'll get will be the same as if that 50 kilometers an hour is out on the road. Um, so it is applicable as it is transferable. Um, what we do at Vortec, where I'm at now, and what we did previously at the Bourbon Performance Center, this we made a really big push of this to make sure that we specifically look at the biomechanics of the rider. And it's not just the position they're in in terms of aerodynamics of that, but how they're producing power and the mechanical effectiveness of that, and even things like comfort and stability on the saddle. Because like your example, if when you're under fatigue, your position breaks down, your head comes up, your your back arches, these things will change both the aerodynamics of the rider, but also their biomechanics. And so we are really we really make a specific point of combining aspects of biomechanics and physiology, musculoskeletal physiology, along with that aerodynamic optimization. Um, and it's, uh, it's a bit of a cliche, but I, I've always liked to use the phrase that, you know, we're, we're trying to make something that's positions that are faster, but faster more of the time uh, for more situations and under more circumstances. And those circumstances might be fatigue. Um, it might be a rolling road where you've got to look around the corners because you don't know what's coming up all those kind of things. So we're very, very pragmatic about how we go about our business in the wind tunnel. There's no point in sending you out in a position that might be super slippery, but you can't ride it. Yeah. With the, the biomechanical assessment, uh, what exactly does that look like? And, and you mentioned they're measuring the efficiency. So can you talk a little bit mm. more about, about how, what, how that works? Well, it's effectively you're, you're an elaborated bike fit because we're looking at changing aspects around the position and posture of a rider on the bike. And that might involve changing uh, the saddle position and usually a lot to do with the handlebar position. But we have to make sure that any of those changes are actually coming out as improved function at the pedal. So we would be measuring forces at the pedal. So we're measuring forces around the pedal stroke. And within that, you're then looking at things like um, the dead spot analysis, the the pedaling effectiveness, so mechanical effectiveness of the pedal stroke, as in, are you wasting power? Are you pushing at the wrong point in the pedal stroke? So anything, any changes that we do, we have to see them through that lens first to understand whether that's having a either a beneficial effect on, on the biomechanics or sometimes a negative effect, or sometimes it's it's a neutral effect. And Yes, we might be able to find aerodynamic gain and save you X amount of watts or improve certain amount of speed. But if that's to the cost of power or the cost of comfort and efficiency, 
then there's risk in that. So we have to balance that equation. And that's why we would use the biomechanical tools, which are effectively force and um, movement. You know, those are, that's what biomechanics is, um, to understand how the function of the ride has been affected by what we do. Mm. So how often is a session that you do with a client coming in about doing wind tunnel testing combined with this sort of looking at different uh, different positions and different uh, different biomechanical uh, configurations so to say versus maybe a rider coming in and already having a very set position that they're very happy with and they just want to test different helmets or different skin suits or yeah. something like that yeah it depends what type of rider we're working with of course but um often as you just described there you might have an experienced rider who's is really honed their position over the the months and years and actually what you are looking at is more equipment choices clothing of course clothing does interact with the position so if we change the clothing it might work more effectively more efficiently with certain positions um but yes so probably i would be saying you know, when we're working with people who we've not worked with before we would really encourage them to go down that combined biomechanics aerodynamics route mm. because it's it's i think it's from a, a best practice point of view the best way of doing it um, because if you don't, the risk is you could be unraveling a lot of good work that they've done on their position by asking them to maybe, you know, bring their arms together, drop their head more, whatever you or rotate the hips, whatever you might be doing. Um, but we do do a significant amount of work with people where the position is, is nailed down. And, you know, like you say, we're looking at other aspects, clothing, equipment, little tweaks here and there. Yeah. But for, for many, then the, the wind, the trip to the wind tunnel is in the same at the same time almost like or it is like a bike fit to to get a potentially a better position that at least should not be a negative impact on their force exactly. and power production but but should yeah. be a positive impact on their aerodynamics what we can do in our wind tunnel which is quite unique is rider power so we can we can actually get the rider to ride at their race pace in the wind mm -hmm. tunnel whilst the wind is blowing at them uh, and actually then look at how they're producing that force how they're pedaling at power and holding that position and so the wind tunnel becomes more of a training tool than it does just a testing tool because you can actually say well look what happens when you're doing this type of effort and actually you're reinforcing you're getting live feedback of how aerodynamically efficient you are as you move your body and so that live feedback is really helpful for the rider to feel what it uh, to get a sense of what it feels like to do it right and to do it wrongly as well um And that's that's a really quite an important part. I think that's where the future of aerodynamics and cycling will move to, not just testing, but using this on a on a you know on a daily session by session basis, even. Yeah, yeah. Why is that not common in in other wind tunnels to be able to do that? It's a hard engineering solution. Um, you, you, you're dealing with very fine measurements of force through a whole variety of strain gauges on the turntable that are very you know, very sensitive and very precise. And you're asking a squishy human to go and produce 200, 300, 400, 500 watts, 1,500 watts, two, two and a half thousand watts at the sprinter, whilst you're trying to measure those fine forces of airflow <laughs> around them. And so when you've got the movement of a rider in there, it's a really quite a complex engineering and mathematics, uh, physics um, equation you're trying to solve. And it takes brains far cleverer than mine to to actually do the programming of that. Yeah um final follow-up on on that particular topic would it would then be how how important is the just having the right position when it comes to your aerodynamics of course also power production but but in speaking about aerodynamics how how much of the drag is the rider in your opinion in, on in average and maybe for more mm. you know the typical time trial list for like or or triathlete that that do slightly longer longer endurance events and uh, yeah in the tt position um it is important and you know if you think what the way that we measure aerodynamic drag is coefficient of drag area cda and that coefficient of drag is the if you like the the shape effect of flow across a shape but the a bit area is is your cross-sectional area that you're presenting to the wind And so the A side of it can actually be really important because if you're sitting quite high on a bike and you're presenting a lot to the wind, no matter what sort of fancy skin suit we put on you or uh, tune the flow of air around you, you're still presenting a you know a significant um, significant block to the wind. Um, now that said, I think what you will probably would have seen in the last 10 years, maybe even in the last five years, is you will see that riders now are not got particularly extreme low positions. There's been a tendency to come up higher at the front and maybe even get a little bit more narrow with the arms. 
because we've realized or you know the world has realized actually it's not just about slamming the front end it's about firstly that probably would compromise your power output but actually aerodynamics is not just that a side of the equation it's about flow and it's about shapes and it's about surfaces and so if we can tune that if we can tame that cd part of the cda part of the equation then we can actually work with far more powerful and sustainable positions um, and I think that's where it's going. I can show you some data on an athlete where they set the lowest CDA score, scores that we'd seen in the wind tunnel at the Bourbon Performance Center with quite an upright position. Wow. And you think, how are you doing that? Well, you've worked across every single component of, of um, your system to optimize it. And in that case, a road rider with a CDA of below 0.14 meters squared, which most of you, if, if anyone's aware of those da- that data, this is a female, by the way, anyone's aware of that data for a road rider, that's exceptional. Yeah, we haven't heard any numbers that low on this show, despite quite a number of interviews about the aerodynamics. Um, <laughs> so, so if you, uh, so I'm going to ask one more follow up about this because that was really interesting. If you are, uh, having a slightly more more a higher position not slamming uh slamming yourself too low what are a couple of examples of things you can do to tune that cd part of the cda so that the increased a isn't a detriment to your overall aerodynamics sure well the first thing is you know the wind is hitting the front of the bike first fundamentally it is so we work from the front backwards um And what you're doing with your arms and your elbows and your upper arms will determine a lot of what happens to the flow of air beyond that those points. Um, so there's probably, if you're going to start experimenting, tweaking in whatever way you're doing it, out on the road, out on the track, whatever you're doing, I'd probably start with hand and forearm position. Uh, and that would be the width of those forearms, but also the angle of them. Um And that will then lead down the line there to what happens to the rest of the, the rest of the body. Yeah. Um, I think that's how that's how we generally would work a session in the wind tunnel. We'd work from the we'd work across the the posture and the shape of the back and the torso and, and the hips, going back to that point about maximizing the power production or protecting it at least. And then work from the front backwards to look at what happens when we change the shapes at the front. Um, the head can be really important to that as well about getting the head yeah, either out of the out of the sticking upness if you like but not always is the case sometimes um, sometimes it doesn't make as big a difference as you might think um, and there's not much you can do with the shape of your body as such you can obviously change the the, the, the angle of how your um, your torso is leaning on the bike but it, there's far more you can do to change the shape of your arms and your upper arms and where your head and your neck are yeah Yeah. Have you found, is there any sort of trends there in terms of the arm position? Like, have you found that uh, angled uh, extensions and keeping your arms and hands uh, a bit higher towards the face almost, is is that beneficial or does it really depend on the overall setup? It it does depend, but I'd probably say in in more cases than not, a slightly higher hand position is, is beneficial. Not, on, not, not only for the pure aerodynamics effect, but actually it can allow a more stable position for the rider, a more comfortable and powerful and uh, robust position, if you like, because by bringing that, uh, those, those, four, those hands up and making the, um, the angle at the elbow joint a little stronger, a little bit more towards 90 degrees rather than open, then that can translate across the rest of the kinetic chain to allow you to relax into the position a bit easier. Um, you'd be surprised. I'm always pleasantly surprised that sometimes when we change contact points on the on the rider's bike, change the arm pad and make it a bit more support, even change the saddle and give it the right level of support in the right places. Visually, you don't look like you're changing the position of the rider, but it allows them from a postural point of view to settle into a position and you can measure the effect of that. And it's usually a positive, it is almost always a positive effect. And so sometimes those proprioceptive things around how the rider feels and sits on the bike and rests their arms and their hands on the handlebars can be actually really quite important. Yeah. Now, I'm going to do just a few quickfire questions around uh, a few pieces of equipment and their impact on aerodynamics and for triathlon specifically. Uh, so these are ones that... Uh, that we haven't really maybe talked as much about as some others uh, helmet for example i think has been done to death uh, on the po- on the podcast but the first one i want to start with is mm-hmm. uh, the tri suit how how important is that for aerodynamics 
Well, it's where the biggest gains will be found, um, mostly in terms of the biggest changes in gains that you can find. Uh, and most people, you know, there is, most people will be familiar of how that, that marketplace has changed over the last 15, 20 years. It's been a ripe area for product development. Um, and, you know, it's a real uh, potentially a little bit of an arms race. You know, the world is catching up each time and uh, every new iteration of something that comes out on the market uh, pushes the game on even further. Uh, I still think there's there's room for improvement there. You know, we're doing work at Vortec around um, customized skin suits that are exactly designed for you and your body shape. And not just that in terms of fit, but even things like the design features on the on there that, that where the seams are and the type and the fabric and the design of the fabric and the active features are designed for you and how your air flows around your body. So the game will get, you know, will get pushed on every time. Um but what is now, you know, and what is now commonplace? What you see on the sort of off-the-shelf um, uh, things from the major comp- major people playing in that sp- in the um, clothing manufacturers, they were once cutting edge of aerodynamics, you know, five ten years ago. But they're now on a you know on a on a tri suit that you can get for 80, 80 pounds. Or um, so the world does move on quite quickly. Um, but the tri suit itself, you know, the torso is presenting that significant proportion of your total surface area. Uh, particularly with broad shoulder triathletes as well. Um, so it's, it's, it is the starting point for most of that story, I think. And what is the most important thing to consider when getting a tri suit? Well, um, it's not just about fit. Um, you know, sometimes we, you, people would think that fit, it needs to be really tight and really, um, uh, you know, really no wrinkles in it. That is important. But it is actually a lot to do when we're talking about aerodynamics and hydrodynamics around the actual fabrics and the textures of those fabrics and so on. Um, there are some really good um, examples on the market that are not expensive. It's just that they've been put together very well. Um, and there are some really expensive examples on the market that might not work for some people or they might not work as well as the amount of money that you're investing in, in them would, would justify. Um so yeah, fit is important, but um, you're looking for features potentially that are, have been well, if you like, well tested. Often starts in the cycling world before it hits triathlon. Um, so go and have a look at what's going on there. And I'll give you a, I'll give you an example of that. Um, we had a. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to name the person. <laughs> I don't can't remember. If she's given me the permission to say this or not. We had a very successful uh, female triathlete who. She was sponsored by a company where they had a variety of tri tops, so the, uh, different tops that she could wear, including a top that was like a vest top um, that she would normally run in, um, but also a, a, a long, um, uh, an elbow length um, sleeved tri suit. And we worked through all those options that she had, and the difference between the vest top and the tri suit. Bear in mind, these are both you know top level pieces of kit. The difference was a fourteen watt differential, and that's forty uh, forty kilometers per hour. And when you translate that to what that do, what that means over an Ironman, 180k, that's nearly seven to eight minutes difference in terms of the speed difference differential of that. And that's not just you know getting on a podium or not. That's game changing. You know that's might be getting in the top ten or not. And so there are options there. You know, and some of the some of the stuff that's out on the market is is really really good. Um, and if you can you know if you can feel like you can justify it to yourself and go for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then shoes. What about the shoes? Mm. Yeah, well, the lower leg and the shoe is important as a whole. The lower leg is more important than the shoe um, because there's more you can do with the lower leg. Um, shoes are a little bit more dependent on pedaling style, whether you're heel down or heel up. Uh, and in general terms, you know, smoothing the, the shoe surface seems to help. So you'll often see... So for example, some of the track riders in cycling using laced shoes rather than shoes with ratchets or boas. Uh, and that's often not just the, the smoothness of the surface, but also the lower volume that that shoe can present. But you've really got to then consider the biomechanics of the rider because the shoe is so important to that, that you know, even if you had a really very um, smooth carbon fiber one piece shoe, unless it's exactly suiting you as your pedaling style, then uh, there is some risk of, you know, of, of just changing just for the aerodynamics. All, all the force in your pedaling goes through the foot, has to. So you've got to get the shoe right from a biomechanical point of view. Yeah. And then the lower leg. Uh, so we have calf guards are uh, becoming a bit more popular, uh, I think, mm. and, uh, and that might be an option. So yeah, what's your take on that? 
Uh, vital. Um, probably more important than the skin suit in some senses. And why I say that is sometimes you can see as big a differences between getting that wrong and right as you would in a skin suit. And the, in terms of a uh, bang for buck, if you like, the cost of getting um, uh, a calf guard is, is typically a lot, lot smaller than buying a full skin suit. And it might be giving you the same aerodynamic improvement uh, as the, the rest of the system put together. Uh, when you asked me that question, it reminds me of um, some work we did with the National Federation some years ago where they were trialing all their Olympic skin suits and they had a whole variety of them, some of them long sleeve, short sleeve and so on. And we tried this long sleeve suit versus a short sleeve suit and there wasn't really any difference. So we chopped the um, forearm piece of the skin suit off uh, to make it into an elbow length. And then we did another run and said, oh, do you know what? There's no real difference there. But we took the fabric that came off the forearm and asked the rider to use them as socks, long socks, halfway up their calf. The difference that made to their aerodynamics, the improvement in aerodynamics was bigger than any of the other differences in the skin suits that were the other 10 skin suits we tested that day, wow. just by chopping the arm off and putting it on the leg. And it, you know, okay, it's, it wasn't the solution. It was a bit of a trial or something, but it illustrated the point of just how important the lower leg can be. Yeah. Well, that's that's really cool to hear that's it's something that i don't think has been mentioned before on the uh, on the podcast but it, it's right you're right i i did actually as late as last year get on the uh, calf guard bandwagon and I, I don't think there is a bandwagon even i think it's kind of an unknown <laughs> as 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 of now in triathlon even though some people are already using them but but you, if you go to a race like you you see quite few pros that are actually using them for example if you do but but many don't yeah, and if you think about it, the leg is moving. You know, the um, the leg is is moving as you pedal. So the air that you're pushing out of the way is not just the air of the speed that you're riding at, but the fact that the leg is moving as well into that. So the interaction between the the oncoming air and you is a much a much more dynamic and a much more turbulent system. So that's why it's uh, it, the lower leg can be really important. We um, I was going to mention before when we were talking about um, uh, fabrics and and so on and, and the skin suits is. The way that we would do it at Vortec is uh, often we do this with a few athletes where we build a mannequin of them and we go and trial our um, clothing solutions on the mannequin. And that mannequin is is basically a, a 3D scan of the rider in their position. So it means you could be on the other side of the world and we can be beavering away in the wind tunnel, um, coming up with the best skin suit and, and uh, overshoes and, and uh, calf guards. And the mannequin actually pedals. It's the coolest thing you've ever seen. Um the mannequin is pedaling along and we are seeing how the flow of air is going over you as an individual and that's where we can take that skin suit design and cl any clothing design to the next level oh yeah that's really cool uh let, let's see if you get some pro triathletes uh contacting you about that after this interview <laughs> well i won't mention who they are but we do have a few and uh you know if you really want to break records you, you've got let's say you really want to break records if you really want to push the records as far as you can then this is one way of doing it yeah yeah i mean i don't know if you're aware you might be aware but maybe you're working with them but uh, the whole breaking seven iron man and breaking eight that's uh, that's an interesting project where where this will these kinds of things will definitely be super important yeah it's going to be exciting i think you know the um I, the biggest part of that story for me is the tactics as well you yeah. know that this is about how you can swim bike and run with other people helping you and that's drafting you know from an aerodynamic point of view it's it's, it's absolutely huge it's the biggest part of that story yeah all right well i want to ask a few questions about coaching as well and uh first of all uh i would like to ask you a few when you have been coaching or if you want to call it advising athletes in the past have you seen a couple of things two or three things that uh, that tend to for some athletes that, that that you have seen several times help athletes maybe break through a plateau when they come to you and they don't know what to do to get to the next level and and just a couple of examples of things that uh, that mm. can work for in that sort of scenario yeah, I think like any good scientist, the first thing is observation and going and watching and seeing what they do and how they do it um, before you make any suggestions about what to change or what you might, you know, what the, the athlete might want to uh, focus upon is just getting a really good sense. And it's just a different set of eyes, isn't it? You know, you're coming in with a different perspective, bringing aspects of you know, objectivity and, and, and so on to that. Um, but yeah, looking and simply looking and learning, seeing what they do, how they do it, and and what they. I always like to see what they go to most. 
So if I, if you're working with an endurance athlete, they'll train a lot. So what are their tried and tested sessions that you see? Because I think it, in my experience, athletes are successful athletes, at least are good at filtering a, a lot of things into the things that they know will work for them. And they're good at trying them, figuring them out, learning about them quickly and figuring out how to manage doing those things, or in some cases not manage them. And they, you know, they become, um, they become tricky things. So just seeing what they call upon, what they rely upon. I think that will tell you a lot about the type of athlete you're dealing with and how well suited they are for the ambitions that they're, they're putting out for. Um, and I think really the thing that I'd probably then be doing is trying to simplify the picture. I think, you know, it's, it's temptation to try and put suggestions of change in there that might be do this, do that. But actually the first step might be to simplify it, to free up some space in that program. You know, look at what the most important things are. Look at what they rely upon. Um, figure out if they're working or not. They probably are, otherwise they probably wouldn't be doing them and they wouldn't have been doing them for that long. And then just free up the other things and, and try and simplify it. Um, going back to the very first question you asked me today about, you know, and I said about just do stuff. I think we can get overcomplicated with training prescription. Um, and actually I'd be looking to just try and strip that out and say what sticks around, what works, what has worked, um, and what do you rely upon? All right. Yeah. And uh, then the next question is, if you would describe the role of a coach, or you can also describe how you see yourself as not a coach if you prefer to, but in terms <laughs> of uh, how how much of coaching is, for example, communication, how much is leadership, how much is being the physiologist and the psychologist and the therapist, if, if you can break it down a little bit, like what, what are the important components and how important are they relative to each other really good yeah good question uh, well i actually would say it's a hundred percent communicator first of all i think if you haven't got that in place and the trust and respect of that relationship in that sound working relationship then all those other aspects we're talking about you might not even get a chance to have that discussion um it's all about that communication and 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 respect and trust that you know that relationship can offer something to both both parts of the the story um I, I I think you've got to flex your style as well. And I think, you know, I, uh, I mentioned before about being a scientist who occasionally coaches and, and coaches who can use the science. Well, it's just wearing a different hat at, the, uh, at a different time. And, you know, being a leader, being a scientist, being a therapist, a friend, all those things that you said are all vital. Um, and knowing at the right time and the, for the right purpose of, of, of when to press that one, where to wear, when to wear that hat. Um the best and most successful examples that I've been involved with are where you see coaches that let the athlete really you know, bring self-awareness to the athlete. And, you know, they create an environment and challenges and training sessions that allow that athlete to develop for themselves and give them a real self physical awareness and emotional awareness and, and the management of themselves. And I think that's, I think that's a really good thing. I, I watched a few sessions with different national federations where you see coaches who are really, really good at that. And they don't, they don't, they don't coach, they nudge. Yeah. <laughs> they nudge and set the environment up accordingly to let the athlete achieve the right things. And that's a, I, I really, really like that. Yeah, that, that's a great answer. It's, uh, it, it reminds me of an episode I did fairly recently with, uh, with David Tilbury Davis about uh, coaching and where coaching might be going in the future. And we talked to quite a lot about these sorts of things, setting up the right environment for, for the athlete and, and letting the athlete learn from, uh, from and, and learning to be autonomous and, uh, and take the right decision. So uh, in, and tra practicing that in training and then bringing that to racing and, and so on. So yeah, I like that answer. Great. And then what would you recommend for coaches out there in particular, but it could be self-coach athletes as well. If you are interested in, in science and physiology, for example, but you want to be better at maybe applying it in practice, being an uh, applied scientist or being a coach and taking that science to, uh, to practice, can you give a, a couple of tips for that? Mm, um, yeah, I, I, I would say write everything down, you know, make notes, make lots of them, um, make notes on what's works, what doesn't, because I think any good scientist is a good observer and you learn from observation before you intervene. And so, you know, that's, you know, get, get stuff written down because over the months and years, 
you'll have an incredible resource of information, knowledge, and wisdom that you can then look back on and go, you know, well, that really worked. And look, I can see that, you know, what's led to that. Um, I was thinking as you were, as you were asking me that, I was thinking of some of the, um, um, and the previous question of some of the coaches I've seen and worked with and had privilege to work with. I'd love to look into their notepads. You know, I'd love to go and have a nose over the, over the shoulder of Jürgen Grobler and see how he worked with all those rowers over the years. Uh, with Malcolm Brown, um, you know, Mel Marshall, who, um, you know, the swimming coach, just see, just having a nose over the shoulder because there'll be gems in that notepad that will be maybe coaching things, but there'll be really good, there'll be real gems of sports science in there. You know, the sports science is lags behind coaching practice by a certain amount of years, but the coach and the athlete will have tried it first. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the scientist might then come along and sort of try and make, um, you know, put, um, put a different language on it and make better sense of it. Um, it might not be the same language, but it would be the same purpose. You know, there'll be real wisdom in there. And as I say, it might be, it'll be really ahead at the time. So yeah, write stuff down and, you know, be, yeah, be systematic and thorough about it, but get it written down. Yeah. Again, uh, super interesting perspective. And, and I really love that answer. It's uh, basically you're telling people to be the scientists themselves rather than like, go and read all the studies and try to take that second hand but actually be the first hand scientist and and, and using what you yeah. actually observe working that that's a great great perspective yes yeah, so, well a scientist is you know is, is, is science is just systematic structured you know investigation um and so i think if you're taking that approach that doesn't matter what um what you call yourself that's that's just a good way of, of going about your business yeah and if you could go back 10 years in time and uh, give yourself uh, one piece of advice as uh, a coach or applied scientist practitioner, what would you uh, tell yourself? Uh, do you know what? I would say you should have written more stuff down. <laughs> <laughs> I look back at it now and go, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, when you've got the benefit of hindsight, you go, oh, that would have been useful to kind of really, you know, figure it out back then. Um so yeah, I honestly would have said that. Just should have written more things down. Um, and I think probably the other part of that would be, you know, be. I was going to say be brave. It's not really being brave. It's it's not a question of bravery or not. But it's be. It's going to explore. It's going to explore. Allow that athlete that you're working with to explore their physical environment and their you know the metaphorical physical and emotional environment and let them do things you know and because they all they will find the answers for themselves and and rather be prescriptive go and explore so i don't think i ever was prescriptive as a coach i don't think i am but i like that approach the op of of setting up the, the the constraints for the individual and the environment that they can explore for themselves mm, yeah all right well uh, let's move on to the rapid fire questions so take just uh, right. one short sentence to answer these and the first one is what's your favorite book blog or resource related to endurance sports Oh, that's a good question. Um, anything by Steven Seiler, uh, fantastic sports scientist uh, based over in Scandinavia. Um, I, I think he's a brilliant communicator of science, but also he asks some great questions and he provides great answers. But most importantly, he's asking really, really good questions of endurance. Another past guest uh, listeners that want to have a listen to that, I think it's episode 176 or something, but you can just search for it on scientifictriathlon.com and find that episode. Uh, next, what's your favorite piece of gear or equipment? I've got two, um, but they're both. Uh, can I use a name? Can I use yeah. a brand? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, they're both pieces of Scott kit. Um, so I got a new Scott Addict RC Pro road bike uh, the other week. Oh, it's fantastic. Um, so that currently is my favorite. But then if it's if the snow is on the ground, my Scott Super Guide ski mountaineering boots. Um, which I really like. Um, I do like getting out in the mountains and, and walking up mountains. Never mind coming down them. Mm. so so where do you do that so so where in the uk are you exactly <laughs> not in the, not UK. In the uk okay Unfortunately, the mountains here around loughborough and generally yeah. not got much snow on them i, I was thinking about, maybe you go to scotland maybe you get it snow there but no okay so okay you can do no, it french alps french, french alps. alps okay yeah and finally what's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success oh good question uh, i'm not very good at answering that kind of question um uh, the one thing I would say is you, you can't be flat out all the time and expect to be you know, creative and productive and successful. I think you've got to know how you work and give yourself that room to step back when you when it's just not happening and then push on when you really can. And somebody said to me the other day, you've only got four hours in a day 
to actually really be productive, efficient. I thought that's probably about right. You know, I'm either good in, in the morning or the afternoon, but ask me to do both. I'm not quite sure. Um, so yeah, don't be flat out all the time, but push on when you can. It probably comes back to that point of training of when it's easy, make it easy. And when it's hard, make it hard. I was going to say that that sounds a lot like good yeah. training as well. All right. Well, uh, this has been fantastic, uh, Jamie. Can you finally tell the listeners where they can follow you? Uh, social media, websites, also Vortec. Uh, you can uh, mention them and where we can find them here as well. Um, yes. Um, so my the company I'm working for at the moment, uh, Vortec Sports, is www.vortexsports.co.uk. Come and have a look around that website because not only is it is an interesting, uh, from a performance point of view, but some great science and engineering there. And you can follow me on Twitter on at Jamie Pringle. Where is, so, okay, you mentioned, yeah, around Loughborough. That's where Vortex is located physically as well for? Uh, no, Vortex is actually oh. down at Silverstone in okay. Northampton. So the Silverstone motor, uh, Formula One motor racing yeah. track, we're on the opposite side of the uh, the the, this, this, um, the setup there uh, on the business park there. Got it. Okay. Right. Well, thank you once again, Jamie. It's been fantastic to chat to you. Have a great rest of your day. It's been my pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that interview with uh, Jamie. As always, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com and we'll have links in the show notes to Jamie's Twitter account and the Vortec website, as well as some related episodes on aerodynamic with guests that I've had on before. Josh Portner, Dan Bigham and Sebastian Schlorike are all related, so check those out. Highly recommended if you want to learn more about aerodynamics. On Thursday, we have another TTS Thursday episode coming out. And then next Monday, I interview Ben Day, who is a performance coach at Team Bike Exchange, formerly Mitchelton Scott, a uh, World Tour team. He's also the personal coach of long-distance triathletes uh, Chris Leiferman and Greg Close. So look forward to that. Stay subscribed and or do subscribe if you're not already so you don't miss any new episodes. If you're looking for ways to get better as a triathlete or endurance athlete beyond just listening to this podcast, be sure to check out what we have to offer on scientifictriathlon.com in terms of coaching services and training plans, and we would love to help you out. Finally, big thanks to our sponsors, Roka, that you can find on roka.com. Go and check out Roka's wetsuits, dry suits, swim skins, goggles, high performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses, and get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can get on roca.com forward slash TTS. And thank you to Senate. Use the Senate Swim Trainer to improve your technique, power and stamina and increase your swim stimulus frequency even when you can't go to the pool or into the open water. And get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can get on senateswimtrainer.com forward slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.